So, ladies and gentlemen, I have honor to present the first speaker of this conference, Xing Tun Yao. Xing Tun Yao is a professor at Harvard University who works in differential geometry, differential equations, and general relativity. He was born in 1949 in Shantou, China. He received his PhD from the University of California in Berkeley in 1971. Professor Yao was a plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Helsinki, that was 1978, and then was awarded the Fields Medal in 1982. So in fact it was 83 because of some things that some of you know. Okay, physically the Congress was in, was in 1983 in Warsaw. He also received, among others, the Oswald Webben, Webben Prize in Geometry, 1981, Humboldt Prize, 1991, Crawford Prize, 1994, and the Wolf Prize in Mathematics, 2010. He is a fellow of the American Academy of, of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, India and the American Mathematical Society, as well as a member of the National Academy of, of Sciences of the United States, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Russian Academy of Sciences, and the Academia del Lince. His proof of the positive energy theorem in general relativity demonstrated 60 years after its discovery that Einstein theory is consistent and stable. His proof of the Calabi conjecture allowed physicists to show using Calabi-Yau compactification that string theory is a viable candidate for the unified theory of nature. And today he will be talking on stability and nonlinear PDEs in mirror symmetry. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also it's a great honor for me to be invited for this important conference. I came to Poland and Krakow in 1983, a long time ago. I came here twice and I'm very pleased to come again as I really like Krakow since the first time I arrived here. And, um, my wife and I came here and was very happy to see the marketplace and the uh, plazas and all that. So I see some more today, yesterday. I'm very happy. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, stability and nonlinear partial differential equations in real symmetry. Uh, this may not be exactly the same as what most other people will talk about. about uh, dynamics and differential equations, but uh, in spirit they are the same. Uh, first of all, uh, the background of this is PDE, nonlinear PDE, uh, but this relates to the subject of um, mathematical physics, algebraic geometry, and certain uh, several fields that are linked together. And the concepts that are built here are more related to algebraic geometry than the standard concept of stability that we learn in uh, PDE or ODE. But actually, they are very much the same. Uh, stability is uh, uh, coming from the concept of some uh, non-compact group acting on the equation. Uh, so in fact, this, uh, I think it's a very important concept that people studying in classical uh, differential equations should learn what people have done in algebraic geometry. So I will outline this talk. Oh, first of all, this is a joint work with uh, Tristan Collin, uh, one of the best young men that I know of. Um, he is in MIT. Um, so there's a concept of uh, communal symmetry that appeared in the last 30 years, 
since the development of string theory appear in geometry and uh, mathematics in general. There are two important concepts uh, are governed by differential equations. One is called special Lagrangian. It is a minimal submanifold that appears in a very um, important way. And the second one is called deformed Hermitian Young Mills equation. So, completely different subjects in mathematics. Uh, so, one is minimal surfaces, one is Young Mills equations. It turns out they are closely related uh, until, uh, well, we don't know yet until we learn it from. Uh, um, um, string theories who gave us a hint that they are duality of each other. So I will talk about uh, some variation approach to deform Hermitian Young Mills equation and connection with algebraic geometry and stability connection, and we talk about application to sympathetic geometry. So first of all, let's understand what is a mean symmetry. It's a symmetry arouse from the observation that some string theory. String theory actually has several different categories. Uh, they are all isomorphic to each other. Uh, one category is called type 2b string theory. And the string theory depends on something uh, called compatibilization. Uh, whatever it is, let's not worry about the detail, what it means. But it's related to some Calabial manifold, x, which I won't explain either. Turns out this type of string theory would be equivalent or isomorphic to a different kind of string theory compatible on a completely different Calabrian manifold. So this is a very important concept that has been uh, inspiring and has been important for a great deal of discussion in mathematics and in physics in the last 30 years. So each of these uh, theories uh, come from a collection of what uh, physically called D brains. Uh, we can naively think that a D brain are simply particles that live in the theory. In type 2 B string, uh, the first one that I mentioned, these are associated with complex geometry. In type 2 A, they are associated with sympathetic geometry. So the basic logan in the subject is that Complex geometry is isomorphic to sympathetic geometry under the concept of Miller symmetry. This is some uh, concept that which we did not expect to know, to see, until string theory gave us a hint. So this is a very marvelous uh, 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 development. They developed, the, the point is that type 2A and type 2B was observed to describe the same kind of physics. So the particles must be the same. And uh, so, the historically, in 1994, uh, mirror symmetry was discovered by uh, my postdoc, Brian Green, and the student uh, of WAFA, uh, Ronald Presser. So, Brian Green and Presser, and independently by Candelas and his whole group in Texas at that time. This was in 1989. And uh, then, Mathematicians start to be interested in it after a conference in 1991 when I chaired the committee. And since then, a lot of algebraic geometers start to be excited about this uh, middle symmetry. And in 1994, Konsevich proposed that middle symmetry should be explained as an equivalence of some category theory, which uh, says that derived category of cohomology of the manifold X. Calabrian space is isomorphic to something called Foucault category. Now, of course, uh, this is a very abstract uh, uh, theory, even uh, to me, it's too abstract, although I work on it. And uh, so one wants to have a different uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, replacement to me. So, geometric mechanism for this duality was conjectured by astrometer, myself, and Sasso. So this is called SYC construction. Uh, so it occurred around slightly later, but around the same time. Uh, both of them are conjectures, 
But both of them have inspired a great deal of important development in mathematics. And many important development has been proved to be true. So that's why we are, we are still very happy to see the development after 25 years. Uh, so these are the things that we like to understand. So uh, in conservation, uh, proposal, derived category, and Foucault category are supposed to mean uh, they, they give some description of possible particles. But not all particles are the same because some of them are stable, some of them are not. Uh, so we are interested in stable particles. Uh, so stable particles are something that you can see. And this satisfies equator motion coming from some Lagrangian action functional. And the expectation is that every particle should decay into stable pieces. And these stable pieces are the interesting particles that we are interested in. They will be described by some equations. That's what we are interested in. So let me go into a down-to-earth description now. So we have a manifold, whatever it means, uh, let's not worry. There's a complex structure, that means locally you can write coordinate chart with complex coordinate. And there's something called holomorphic volume form and there's a cater form. Holomorphic volume form describes a complex structure and cater form describes a metric structure. With such a setting, uh, there's an uh, important work due to Harvey and Lawson in 1982, they were interested in constructing minimum of manifolds, those which minimizing area. So first of all, they look at a special class of such manifolds. They look at those manifolds which is called Lagrangian. Lagrangian means the sympathetic form which is defined by the Kähler form restrict to L is equal to zero. So these are class of manifold that we study a great deal in dynamical system, uh, but also in geometry. Uh, now, the important um, uh, statement that we want is special Lagrangian. So it's more than Lagrangian, but special. So what does special mean? Here, what it means is that the holomorphic N form, in the case of uh, CN is the standard uh, volume form that you see, and you multiply with some constant, which is exponential minus i of some constant theta in r. We take this guy and take the imaginary part of it and restrict to the sub manifold is equal to zero. So these are called special Lagrangian. Why are we interested in such a, uh, such a uh, sub manifold? According to Harvey Lawson, uh, generalizing uh, argument due to Wettinger, this class of manifold would be early minimizing. So in Euclidean space, you want to find submanifolds whose area would be minimizing among all competing submanifolds. This gives you an important class, a very rich class of such submanifolds, besides complex submanifolds. So turns out, from um, media symmetry side, this special Lagrangian equation can be read as an equation of motion for some special uh, stable particles. And so the Foucault category mentioned by uh, conservatory uh, parameterized Hamiltonian deformation class of Lagrangian submanifold of, of this uh, Carabial manifold. So, a class within this uh, um, theory is called stable if a class, a homology class of this uh, submanifold contains a special Lagrangian uh, submanifold. These special Lagrangians are automatically early minimizing in their homology class. It provides a high codimension minimal submanifold. So in order to understand this uh, better, when, let, let's try to write down an equation for it. So let's look at Cn, uh, complex number multiplied n times, and you have a real coordinate, xi is the real part, and the yi are the imaginary part. And this, of course, is a standard uh, so-called Carabial structure, just a standard Euclidean metric. 
And the graph is called Lagrangian, even only if yi is a gradient of some function. This is a standard fact. A Lagrangian cycle locally can be written as a graph of the gradient of some function. It's called special Lagrangian, even only if it solves the nonlinear partial differential equation. So in the more fancy notation we wrote earlier, can be written in a down to the f term by this equation. So you take the Hessian of the function f. So remember, f is the gradient of a the gradient of this function defines a graph for the Lagrangian cycle. Being special means that we want the following equation. If lambda i are the eigenvalues of the Hessian of f, and we define the arctangent of lambda i, and sum up of it is a constant. Uh, that's uh, the equation that we are dealing with. Now, this equation is clearly a nonlinear equation and rather interesting uh, equation. Uh, actually, you can write down this equation without talking about special Lagrangian, uh, minimum submanifold, and all that. Uh, it's uh, an elliptic equation, turns out, and we all know that minimum submanifold are elliptic equations. But in writing this form, it's not trivial to check they are elliptic, but they are elliptic equations. So f is unknown, and you write down an equation. So these are nonlinear equations. So we describe something called d plane uh, in the Foucault category, namely there are special Lagrangian cycles that are governed by nonlinear equations that I wrote down earlier. These are Monson and Pierre type equations. Now d planes in the other side are governed by different objects, and these are so-called coherent sieves or wetter bundles. So there are class of wetter bundles, and let us take a special case of uh, such uh, a, a object. So let's look at a lie bundle. So a lie bundle defined over a sub-variety of the uh, Calabian manifolds. And the equator motion of these objects were derived independently by different groups of people uh, when it satisfied the uh, concept of deep length. And this equation, we call it deformed hermitian young mills equation because it generalized the concept of hermitian young mills equation. young mills equation was an equation to describe particles, as we know. And hermitian means that it's compatible with the complex structure. Deformed means the following equations. I'm writing down here. Take the line bundle. Suppose it solved the deformed Hermitian Young Mills equation, if there exists a metric defined on the line bundle H, and we define its curvature to be the complex differentiation of log H. And this is called the curvature of the bundle. If we get a metric on the line bundle, you differentiate it twice, you get the curvature. And this F must satisfy the following equation. So, What's this equation say? Omega is a Kähler form. Omega minus the curvature is still a one run form. And I take the wedge part of it to dimension V. So it's top dimension. And then I multiply it by constant exponential minus i theta hat. And I want the imagined part of it to be zero. So this becomes an equation. And the real part of it, we want it to be positive. This makes sure that it's elliptic. So these are the two equations that appear on the bundle side. Now, so this turns out to be elliptic equation, and actually it's not a trivial thing to check. Uh, I challenge you to prove that it's elliptic by uh, dialect calculation. It's not so easy. Um, now this actually went back to the works of um, uh, Mike Douglas uh, in string theory, and by Thomas and myself uh, about almost uh, 25 years, close to 30 years ago, we conjectured that the existence of special Lagrangian is equivalent to some notion, algebraic notion of stability. So what are we trying to do? We want to solve this equation, this is called hermitian young mills deformed hermitian young mills equation. So this equation on the bottom, we try to Prove existence of such a thing. And also, we have the special Lagrangian cycle that I just mentioned, this equation in the bottom. 
uh, summation arc tangent lambda i to be constant. So we want to de decide which Lagrangian cycle can be deformed so that we can find a solution of this equation. Okay? So we want to find f. And at the same time, we want to find uh, 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 this equation. There are two sets of equations. Turns out we find these two system equations are equivalent to each other uh, under the SYC uh, uh, symmetry. So this is kind of amazing, two completely different set of equations are equivalent to each other. Now, well, that's only a conjecture that they're equivalent. But we want to figure out why they are true, and then we want to give reasons why they are true. So first of all, we want to solve this equation but these equations are not solvable in general. We can find reasons why it cannot be solved in general. So we want to find a condition on L and V in order for it to be solvable. And while we can find a condition for it to be solvable, we can say that if we satisfy some kind of subsolution, then it exists and all that. But that is not satisfactory. What we like to see is that we want to find a condition which can be computed explicitly so that when we give you a uh, object like L and V, we can know whether the solution can be found. So we want to find algebraic, uh, purely algebraic notion in order for it to exist. We know that it must be stable. This stability is in fact related to the stability that you learn in dynamics. Uh, except in terms of complex uh, group of uh, uh, transformation acting on it. Okay, so there's a uh, conjecture that we make, and uh, uh, it has been developed. I mean, we, Douglas and uh, Thomas and myself make this conjecture, and then it has been developed more and more, so now it becomes a folklore conjecture, although we were the first one who uh, proposed it. So first of all, we want to say that a Lagrangian submanifold, those equations exist even only if it's stable in some sense. And in the case of special Lagrangian, we would say that it's stable in Foucault category. In the case of deformed hermitian young equation, we would like to say that it's stable in the sense of bridge land. Now, these stability conditions are very algebraic in nature, and we want to conjecture that the existence of nonlinear equations, their system of equations, are equivalent to some algebraic stability that was conceived by algebraic geometers. Um, and this uh, study uh, extensively in the last uh, 10 years, especially the concept of bridge and stability, and uh, many people study it. Uh, it's become so abstract that I feel difficult to read those papers myself. Uh, bridge plan stability. They are all category theory, and uh, they, are, they look very nice to me, except it takes much longer time for me to understand, to understand now. But anyway, let's come to deform hermitian young mills equation. There's a major problem that I want to solve at this moment. Um, besides the fact uh, they are important for this symmetry, but also because I'm interested in Kähler geometry in general. So let's take a Kähler manifold, not necessarily Calabria anymore, and take a cohomology class in the second cohomology of this manifold, which is H11, so to speak. The important question we'd like to answer is this one. Can we deform in this cohomology class A, can we find alpha, a one one form, so that this holds, this equation holds? This was a deformed hermitian young mills equation. Uh, put it in a more general form. Uh, so n is the dimension of x, and we want to find theta so that this holds. So this is the question that we like to solve. So this is a beautiful equation. Omega is given, omega is a cater form. Alpha is the one one form we are looking at to solve, and we want to find constant so that this holds. So this is called deformed hermitian young mills equation. The reason uh, that, that we are interested in this equation is because the concept of supersymmetry that appears in, uh, in string theory. And uh, so put in another form, a uh, different way, we just want to say that given omega, we want to find alpha, uh, which is the one-one form, 
so that the integral of it belongs to uh, a positive number times exponential i theta, where exponential i theta is a compass constant. Okay? But uh, this is the equation that follows immediately. This, is, this uh, last uh, sentence is a direct consequence of the first equation, but just integrate it. But the first equation is a pointwise equation. The second equation is integral form of the equation. So the integral form of the equation is a necessary condition uh, in order for the first equation to hold. So we want to solve this equation uh, under the assumption the last one holds. The last one is a topological condition because the integral of this omega plus i alpha is a topological number. So we can check it without any problem. Okay. Once we can reduce the topology, then we are pretty happy because we can check whether it's true or not because they are computable. So the problem is very simple. Given some topological condition on omega and alpha, we want to solve the pointwise equation, imaginary part, exponential minus i theta, whether the theta exists or not, to solve that equation. Okay, so this is an interesting equation, but it looks complicated. So uh, I want to write it in, in a more down to the earth term. So I can uh, write down omega. Omega is a Kähler form, so it has two indices, omega ij bar, and I invert it, so we have omega I, jk bar. Alpha is a one one form, so have two indices also, uh, so alpha k bar l. These two guys, this I sum them up, it defines a form. Uh, this is a uh, endomorphism or a uh, matrix, if you want. Uh, matrix is the matrix with the JL uh, index given by this summation omega JK bar alpha K I bar, K bar L. Okay, so this defines a matrix, a symmetric, Hermitian symmetric matrix. Uh, you can find its eigenvalue. So K has eigenvalue. I call lambda i, and I take summation arctangent of lambda i put together. Uh, we call it theta. So what do we achieve? Given a Kähler form omega and a alpha and a one one form, close one one form, I define this sum. Well, it turns out the equation is equivalent to this simple statement. Capital theta, which is defined as summation arctangent lambda i, is equal to some constant. This constant, by its rare definition, because arctangent is defined between minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, you sum them up. So theta bar, theta hat would be an element sitting in minus n pi over 2 to n pi over 2. So this is a good thing because we now, um, the equation actually helps you to determine a number which sets you at the last equation exponential i theta equal to exponential i theta hat. Now this is defined more than just mod 2 pi. We actually know how it's supposed to define, even when it, we can unwrap the face, uh, so that it sets like this, using the uh, equation. So now, we have rewritten the equation that I wrote down earlier to be summation arctangent lambda i equal to theta hat. So this clearly is a nonlinear equation. Omega is given. Alpha is some unknown we want to find, and we want to solve this equation. So theta hat is some number we want to look for also. OK. So this, in this form, we see that this is very close to the special Lagrangian equation. The special Lagrangian equation was finding f, which make the Lagrangian to be graph, and we want to look for summation arctangent lambda i equal to constant, where the lambda i are the eigenvalues of the Hessian of f. So the Hessian of f here is, is replaced by the endomorphism k. So putting in this form, k is very much the same as Hessian of f. The equation will be exactly the same, you see. That's the reason why we derive this deformed Hermitian Young Mills equation, and there's a reason that the special Lagrangian cycle 
is really symmetric to the Hermi deformed Hermitian Young Mills uh, equation. Uh, there, you can see the uh, analog between them, internal equation, but they are enjoying completely different uh, geometric, ge geometric properties that we have to develop on our own on each category. One is in terms of sympathetic geometry and the other one is complex geometry. So that's what we are going to do now. So, so the form Hermitian equation as now you can see is a natural analog of the graphical special Lagrangian equation and we want to see how it works. Now, in the case of the deformed Hermitian equation, a few years ago when uh, uh, Jacob and Collins are both um, assistant professor in, uh, in uh, Harvard, we worked together, we found a necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of solutions in, for the deformed Hermitian equation. The one says summation arctangent lambda i equal to constant. So we do it. And uh, for man, in many ways, uh, it is satisfactory because uh, we prove that uh, if there is a representative which satisfies a sub solution, it's like when you solve the harmonic functions, uh, you use Perot method, you, def you look at the sub solutions, and you look at the family of sub solutions, you take some kind of maximum principle, you can solve it, the, the equation. So we did that. And we found that, uh, that we can find enough estimates so that whenever there exists a sub solution of the deformed Hermitian Young Mills equation, then we can solve the equation. Under the assumption that theta hat is large. Now, there are two questions here. Theta hat large is actually quite an interesting uh, question. Uh, why we choose it? Uh, that we choose it because of some technical. Uh, clarity uh, uh, when we prove the theorem. Uh, the lower phase is actually very interesting when theta hat is less than that. And this still needs to be explored. Uh, but in any case, we prove that existence of solutions implies existence of solutions. So that's pretty good for many people working in differential equations, but this is far away from what we need, uh, what, what, what we want. The reason is that we have a great, time, great difficulty to see what uh, this means in terms of uh, um, algebraic geometry. That means, given a light bundle to you, given a manifold to you, we have no idea how to create such a sub solution. If you find a good way to, to create such a solution algebraically, then we are happy, but we don't know how to do it. So we have to find another way to, to see, to understand this problem. So, in a way, it's uh, satisfactory in terms of analysis, but it's not quite uh, how to connect this with the algebraic conditions. So, that's the idea uh, that we try to uh, do now. Now, given the alpha, which is a cohomology uh, class, we can write it in terms of fixed one, alpha naught, we fix alpha naught there. We can write any other cohomology class in terms of alpha naught plus i dd bar of some function. So there's a great uh, statement of something called dd bar lemma. Uh, alpha can be written and be determined by some function phi. So that's good. And then we will go on to use this idea and discuss a space. The space is the function phi so that the total angle that we discussed earlier minus theta hat is less than pi over 2. That means it solves the equation up to some error. The error is pi over 2. Not a small error, but within pi over 2. So we are looking at the phase in terms of pi over 2. So I divide uh, the, the space of functions into this way, x theta at. So alpha theta, alpha phi is this uh, class that we just mentioned. And this is an interesting uh, class that we are looking into. OK, so we have all this uh, Hilbert space uh, where all the phi sets are like this. Now in order for, uh, 
look uh, for, for, for the equation to be solvable, x theta hat has to be non-empty. Well, if x theta hat is empty, there's no way you can solve the equation, uh, obviously, because uh, it's too far away. But first of all, we proved that there's at most one value of theta hat for which it is non-empty. Uh, okay. So that's good. So at most one value is not empty, we're looking at that value. Uh, well, if it's empty for all theta hat, there's no solution. So period, no, nothing to worry about. Now the human space can be made into an infinite dimensional manifold. So we are now interested in understand the solution space, in order the possible solution space nearby them, in order to understand what kind of condition we have imposed in order to solve the problem. So the tangent space of this uh, Hilbert space is naturally just itself, uh, it's linear space. And on this linear space, there's an inner product. The inner product psi1 and psi2, when they belong to this Hilbert space, we just put it as a simple inner product psi1, psi2, times the real part of this integral. So this defines the inner product for you. Uh, natural inner product because the right hand side corresponds to the equation that we are interested in. The real part of this guy is supposed to be positive. That was our assumption that we are interested in. So uh, we only will deal with the case when theta hat is bigger than n minus 1 pi over 2. So big face case. Uh, now, in this manifold, uh, well, I mean, so. So remember, here I define an inner product and it's positive definite inner product. Uh, we want to study the geodesic in this, in, in this uh, manifold. So the, the inner product always gives rise to some uh, uh, geodesic equation, it's ODE, in this manifold. So uh, now, on this manifold, we have a one form. The one form is defined in the following way. One form is acting on a function psi, and the action will be given by this simple fact. The previous thing is real part of the whole thing is positive. Now we are looking at the imaginary part. Remember, we are looking at the case where the imaginary part is equal to uh, zero. Okay, so I take this one form, and we prove that uh, this one form is coming from a well, is a closed, or is exact one form, is closed, is, can be integrated to a well defined function uh, i, which defines the h which has a property that its critical point is exactly the deformed hermitian young mills equation. So what do we find? We find a function, a function node defined on the Hilbert space whose critical point are the solution of the equation, deformed hermitian young mills equation. And import, more importantly is that this function node is converse along smooth geodesics in the Hilbert space. So along the Hilbert space, I just mentioned, there are many geodesics which we need to prove existence and also smooth. And then this functional is a functional we like very much because the critical point of them are the deformed Hermes and Young Mills. And now we prove that it's actually converse. Well, the converse function is always nice. Uh, there are only some simple ways you can move. And so we are interested in understand uh, uh, this function now because it gives rise to the solution of the equation. Okay, now in order to prove that uh, the function now has a critical point, we like to see the following picture. You know, when you have a uh, convex function, the critical point, if it goes to infinity in both sides, uh, then you have a critical point like this. But on the other hand, you may have one case where the critical uh, it doesn't go, it goes down in this way, and this is not what, what we want. So we need to determine the slope of this functional near infinity. The human space is large, it's infinite dimensional. We have to give a description of the infinity of this human space so that we can describe determine the slope of this functional near infinity so that it will point down in, to give rise to a critical point. That's what we are interested in. Okay, in order to do it, we need three steps. First step is the axis of 
sufficient regular geodesic in the space H. So I describe the H to you, which is the space that we're interested in to produce a solution, and we need to prove existence. With no geodesic, there's nothing to talk about because the, the functional uh, only is convex along that geodesic. And we need to make uh, sense of some point of boundary H and try to relay to algebraic geometry so that we can detect what's going on. So we want to evaluate the limit scope of the functional in terms of algebraic invariance. Those, these are the three steps that we are interested to develop in order to uh, understand the deformed hermitian yamis equation. And we like to connect these things to the conjectural bridgeland stability condition. Bridgeland uh, conjecture some stability condition. Uh, actually, there are uh, complicated conjectures there. Uh, here, we are giving a quite a different point of view from Bridgeland. And uh, so, first of all, let's try to understand what the geodesic is. Geodesic can be looked at in the following way. I take the manifold, I multiply with the annulus, the annulus sitting in C, and there's a projection into X. And let us look at the complex Hessian defined on the total space, on the product space, and we have the following equation. <coughs> so given two points on our Hilbert space, I want to join them by geodesic. So geodesic is now a function uh, dependent on parameter S. And S is actually coming from T, is S equal to minus log T. So we are looking at circle invariant geodesic. And so therefore it depends on the absolute value of T. And turns out the geodesic equation is the one that I write down here, 1.1. 1 .1. Imagine it uh, plus uh, this whole thing. Where pi is projection, the pi x is projection into the manifold x and pull back the omega here. And this is the equation uh, very similar to the original equation of deformed Hermitian armules. The only trouble is that this equation is not quite elliptic, it's degenerate elliptic. There are some degeneracy here, which we need to overcome. But nevertheless, this is the equation that we are interested in. This is called geodesic, you know, here. So we recognize this whole thing uh, by adding some epsilon uh, perturbation here. The thing that's missing was the parameter part t. So I add epsilon square i dt rest dt bar, make this equation to be elliptic. Uh, so the original equation is not elliptic, and we add some viscosity to it. Uh, so this is a viscosity uh, argument, uh, solving the thing with a perturbation, and then let epsilon go to zero. So uh, this was studied by many people in the case of Conrad's domain. Uh, but here we are, to, uh, uh, in our end, here we are studying in CN. So, now, in the domain case, there exists continuous geodesic. But continuous only is not good enough for our geometric application. We need some differentiation in order to discuss uh, convexity. So, now, the geodesic equation is fully nonlinear, degenerate elliptic equation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the epsilon geodesic equation, on the other hand, is elliptic, is fully nonlinear, on the other hand. So we prove uh, a very important theorem that we prove here uh, is that there exists C1 alpha solution for the geodesic equation of boundary data. So this is true for degenerate elliptic equation, fully nonlinear, is C1 alpha. And the functional can be defined on this geodesic equation and it's also convex along this geodesic. So that's what we prove. Only with this, we can talk about stability and all those things. So this is uh, an um, argument based on partial differential equation, maximum principle. OK. And then we do a scaling. Actually, the argument we do is to do a scaling uh, because we are using this uh, uh, method of uh, viscosity. And we change the uh, interval, uh, the annulus, by putting epsilon in this way. And then we can scale away the epsilon dependence on dt, dt bar. 
uh, simply multiply t in the right way. And then we are solving this equation in that following way. And this is the equation now looks uh, no epsilon, but of course the epsilon is there, is except by parameterized the domain and also uh, the time. Uh, so this is the deformed hamilton young mills equation itself in dimension one dimension higher with bounded data. So uh, we proved that uh, takes a lot of work to prove that in this equation there exists estimates. So T and the mixed derivative estimate, they can blow up C over epsilon, but the blow up is understood later by changing the time back in the right way. And uh, T has a supposed to carry epsilon with it, so it's C over epsilon square. And the spatial derivative is much better, so you get this estimate. So these are obtained by maximum principle argument and non-trivial argument. So then we can obtain by rescaling and pass to a limit as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, the regularity is much better than one would expect. Uh, so uh, so we, we notice that these uh, estimates are clearly very sharp by the mean value and the comparison freedoms. On the other hand, since phi solves the nonlinear PDE, one may expect a lack of regularity to propagate in the spatial directions. Uh, the most difficult part estimate is a uniform bound for the spatial Hessian, which is important for us. Uh, we apply maximal uh, principle to the larger spatial eigenvalue. This is rather non-trivial estimate. It takes many pages to calculate. So the deformed hermitian yang uh, operator in dimension n has contrast level set in a range between n minus 1 pi over 2 to n pi over 2. So uh, we suggest that, that the larger space-time eigenvalue is a subsorption of the linearized equation, and this is obtained by doing some estimate of this type. Uh, and <coughs> let me not go into uh, too many details of this. Uh, it's getting rather complicated. Uh, so this gives a simplified uh, proof, in fact, for the previous known case of homogeneous complex Monsen pair equation. Uh, the S, in other words, the argument actually simplifies some of the P's as well on, on some different uh, cases. Anyway, so what we have is that besides the functional, I mentioned the I functional, which gives rise to different hermitian yang equation as critical point, we want to introduce some other functional. This functional uh, was actually appeared in my paper uh, on Calabi conjectures. And so this functional has this form, and we prove uh, the following important uh, uh, proposition. If theta hat is large, then the i is convex, and also this functional that we just defined here on the top is actually r phi. And also, uh, this functional is conca has concave real and imaginary parts. So these are the three important functionals that we use for our purpose. And all of them are important. Now, so we have studied the geodesic equation. We know there is enough regularity. And we know the functional has good convexity properties and all that. Now we go to the second step. We construct curves in the Hilbert space that we move to boundary, to infinity. So let's give you an example how to construct such a curve uh, going to infinity. Now this has to come from algebraic geometry because as I mentioned to you, uh, we are doing an algebraic object. We want to reduce the criteria to algebraic geometry. So we want to construct such a curve. So we take a sequence of ideal shift the next family of coherent ideal shift. What it means is that we have a sequence of subvarieties, subset of each other, and we locally define for each of these subshift, uh, they are defined by holomorphic functions, and we then construct a S1 invariant function by this uh, psi function, which taking summation square of it, and then weight with t to some power, so this is an important functional associated with the ideal shift. So from the algebraic geometry, 
we construct some function for us to understand what to do. So this side function will give rise to a path, a curve, in the Hilbert space trying to go to infinity. So that's what we are trying to see. So what we do is that given a function phi, and we find a delta sufficiently small, so that this functional, this function phi x plus delta times psi, the psi is the one that I just construct, it will belong to h for each t. So this is just a path sitting in the Hilbert space, what we just mentioned. Produce a path which becomes singular as t equal to zero. And we call this a model curve associated to this algebraic geometric fact, the ideal sieve. And the idea is to construct a point to this uh, path uh, by geodesic for all tau. So this will produce a path going to infinity uh, uh, from phi naught. So you see, I join them by geodesic, each of these. Uh, there's a path, the phi xt is not a geodesic, but I join each point by geodesic, like this way. And so, given a curve going to infinity, I join them by geodesics. And the functional can be computed by hand after doing some log resolution of singularity on the flat ideal. So the functional that I mentioned can be computed on these geodesics that I just mentioned. And turns out we can compare the convexity, concavity of these properties, or these functionals along the geodesic. We can produce algebraic geometric obstruction, the excision of solutions. And this can be compared with the bridge length stability, as I mentioned earlier. So in this case, turns out uh, we can do the following thing. Suppose we get a um, flat ideal that I just mentioned earlier, and I define these two functionals. Um, this is called central charge. Uh, the central charge of L is defined in this formula, and central charge of L on X is defined on the right hand side. So one depends on L, one depends on, on, um, uh, depend on E, one depends on X. Then you found, we found out the following condition. These are necessary conditions. Now notice these integral are completely algebraic geometric quantities. Uh, we can compute it by algebraic <coughs> geometry. This central chart I mentioned, the integral of things over sub-varieties. So we found out in order for L to be solvable to the deformed hermitian young mills equation, it must satisfy this inequality I just write down. Imagine part of the central chart over E divided by central chart X is bigger than equal to zero. And if the equality only holds when the uh, flat sieve is t to the power r. So uh, let's look at, look at this picture more carefully. The central charge is actually a complex number. And let's just talk a very simple case on how it looks like. And a simple case is just take, instead of a sequence of some variety, just fix one. The central charge in, becomes very simple. Uh, it's exponential i omega times train of l over v, etc. Okay, now, so the idea is that if L admits a solution, then you must satisfy these two necessary conditions. Uh, imagine part of it is positive, and imagine part of the ratio is positive. Now, this is related to something called stability condition. Let's take a look at what it says. This is central charge over the whole space X. It's a vector, complex vector. And we want to see how, what it means. If it's on a sub-variety, the ratio, the thing that I mentioned to be positive, means that it sets up this condition, uh, that it is under the shadow of the central charge of X. On the other hand, if it sits above it, uh, in this picture, then it is obstructed. That means it violates the existence of solution to the hermitian young mills equation. This is the other case where it violates the existence because the whole space is empty. So what does this mean? This means that that important quantity, which can be computed 100% by algebraic geometry, 
the central charge of L over X and the central charge of L over V. For all subvarieties of X, we prove the important criteria which is shown in these two pictures, these three pictures. Okay? For all subvariety V, the central charge must behave like this. It cannot behave like this. Uh, uh, it cannot behave like this one or this one. So these are the conditions that are not allowed. Uh, so in other words, we conjecture. Well, first of all, we prove that this must hold. We conjecture the converse is also true. Those inequalities are wrote down is sufficient to guarantee the existence of the solution. That's what we do. Now, these are actually very non-trivial uh, uh, question. Uh, we propose that a nonlinear equation can be solved if and only if uh, some uh, inequality, which is called stability inequality, holds. This conjecture turns out is true if the manifold is complex two dimension, real four dimension and complex dimension two. And also, we can do it for some uh, large category of solutions. Now, now let us brief, uh, briefly compare with what is known in algebraic geometry due to Bridgeland. And in this case, uh, they even uh, need a uh, conjectural definition, actually. And uh, so I define the Bridgeland stability in this way. It's very similar to what I wrote down earlier. And they make a conjecture of some phase, which is very analog to what I just see the picture. But uh, they are different on the other hand. Uh, so they define some object called bleach lens, stability object and all that. But let's not worry about too much uh, into it. Uh, you can see the obstruction is very much analog to some uh, category uh, motivate uh, stability due to bleach lens. And but here we derive the whole thing by looking at nonlinear differential equation and try to find the obstruction by solving some equations. So, um, so we can apply the same result to the existing problem for special Lagrangian in certain situations. Here I've been putting all effort to talk about deformed hermitian young mills equations, but since they are supposed to be the same as special Lagrangian, we expect the same thing holds for special Lagrangian equation, which is for minimum of manifold. And, uh, well, this uh, has been extended and studied by many people uh, in the um, community of uh, middle symmetry and for toric uh, final manifold and all that. And here we can look at a special case. Uh, something called uh, Lander Ginsberg theory, which I don't want to go into the great detail to that. But uh, there is a, uh, such a concept of uh, space of almost calibrated Lagrangian cycle, which I don't have time to uh, go into now, but it's an analog of what we saw in the deformed hermitian young mills equation. And it's very, very simple case is to study a manifold of this type. Uh, so uh, it's a light bundle over P1 and consider degeneration corresponding to this ideal sieve I mentioned earlier. Turns out we can find one parameter family of Lagrangians in the cylinder. Uh, the interval CO to 2 multiplied by R. The original um, uh, special Lagrangian is just a linear line, uh, Y to minus KY. But we can, under our deformation that I study, is deforming the special Lagrangian by this uh, concept, by this delta times this function. So using the idea that we use in deformed hermitian young mills, we can deform a Lagrangian, which is a straight line, by this. And this comes out to a very interesting uh, 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 statement uh, on, uh, on the special Lagrangian. Turns out the Lagrangian bubble of uh, factors uh, when take delta goes to zero. At the beginning, uh, it's a graph, and then you bubble off some fiber. Uh, and this rather interesting uh, uh, degeneration appears in so-called Foucault category. Uh, so 
This uh, therefore uh, give rise to interesting uh, questions in Foucault category uh, where we should consider mapping cones and all this. So I think time is up. I stop here. Thank you.